but we do have some Paleo Indian sites. One of our oldest in New England is the Bullbrook site in Ipswich. But in any case, um, there are sites spanning 12,000 years ago up until uh, European contact about 450 years ago. And at JT Berry, we have from the Middle Archaic and the Late Archaic, the Susquehanna Archaic, and then Middle Woodland. This is what we found in our, in our investigations. Um, Bullen did have one projectile point that dated to the early woodland um, from in his in his collection, but we did not find any early woodland um, artifacts or have radiocarbon dates from the early woodland. And those are just the material culture, the type of projectile points that we usually find, and types of um, <coughs> other kinds of tools. <laughs> other terms I will talk about a lot, mostly artifacts and features. And so artifacts are portable, you know, movable objects. You can pick them up and bring them back to the lab. Um, and I do say here that we need to be careful not to let the artifact itself just uh, um, instill expectations of what it is because you can, a lot of times, it might look like a, a spear point, but it could have been used for something else. It could have been ceremonial. It could have not, maybe not just for hunting. So, we have to keep an open mind. Things that we don't <coughs> find around here are organic materials. So we find only things that are not going to disintegrate. So the stone tools, pottery, because it's been fired and burned, and that preserves. Um, it, shell will preserve things um, if you, shell has uh, neutralizes the soil because the soil is so acidic that <coughs> anything organic doesn't preserve. So we do have a very limited picture based on the material culture. So we have to fill in the gaps and keep an open mind. Um, so, and then a feature, well, ecofacts are remains found at the site that are part of the cultural record, but they weren't culturally made. So seeds, shell, bone, um, they're all part of the site. And uh, we call those ecofacts, plant pollen. And then features are what we really like to find because those will tell us a little bit more about the activity. A spear point can say, all right, somebody may have hunted or uh, you know, certainly someone was here. But our features will tell us if they were cooking, uh, if there was a house structure, um, if there was a burial pit, stains in the soil that we look for, basically. And we call them non-portable artifacts because you couldn't pick up a feature and bring it back to the lab without ruining its integrity. So just even picture a stone wall, like you couldn't take it back. So features we excavate very carefully, and we pay a lot of attention to them. And, um, and we also try to collect charcoal from them, if there's any charcoal left, or any little bits that we can find in them. We collect soil samples from them, and we do specialized analysis back at the lab, which I'll talk about. So at JT Berry, we found overall, let me see, I don't have the number written down. We found 14,347 artifacts, and we found 43 features, so they all really are um, very important. Um, and then lithic, just in general terms, uh, so when I'm talking about lithics, I may throw that out, and that's just I'm talking about the rocks, and mostly are the, a lot of our artifacts are lithic, are made of lithic, so we have paleo old, Lithics, new lithics, very small ones and very big ones. How deep would they be in the ground? That's a very good question. We start <laughs> finding um, material um, right under the surface. We can uh, just a, an inch. We do everything in metric as well, so it's centimeters, but just um, a couple of centimeters. It's been there for 6,000 years. How can it be on the surface? It's because there hasn't been a lot of soil development. And if in an area where there's not a lot of wind blown or water lane uh, activity or uh, sediments, some of these materials are right in the first 10 centimeters. Because I live in North and Main Street, less than a mile from the whole place. And part of my land has never been touched. Oh. So can I go? Should I go start looking in my backyard? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you have to do it very carefully and, <laughs> and record, you'll see. <laughs> I, you know, it's a very, it, nothing has ever been done there. I mean, what we find, and you'll see in our pictures, are plow zones everywhere in New England. And huh. we can really tell the plow zones. So that first layer 
usually is a little bit mixed up. It's not completely disturbed. It doesn't completely ruin a site, but it's a little mixed up. But all these things that the artifacts, the ecofacts, the features, all go together to give us the archaeological record, which is what we strive to interpret. We, um, they're all, uh, that's what we're, we're doing, is we're trying to reconstruct, um, reconstruct the past. Everything we do in the field, we try to do carefully enough so that we can basically reconstruct the site back in the lab. Uh, of course, once we excavate it, we're destroying it, so we can't put it back together. So we have, uh, and then, which is why context is very, very important. And this is why um, everything needs to be very carefully mapped in, photographed, notes taken. I know one of the things that is always um, can be a very big drag for a lot of people and students, especially teaching field schools, is. Um, is stopping and having to take all the notes and recording everything on about five different sheets of paper um, because it's so much fun just to keep finding the artifacts. But um, as I said, we have to be able to record everything. And if you just dig down, dig a hole and find a spear point, um, you don't know that that spear point wasn't connected to something else that was right here. So one of the things that, uh, and we have found that instances of very important finds where we have found artifacts that are related that have told, told us a whole new story and given us a lot of new information. And we wouldn't have found them if we only excavated, we had just dug down, <coughs> pulled out the artifact, and that was the end of it. But by opening up a large area and uh, excavating carefully, and we can think, you know, we will know the context that artifacts, where they, where they come from. And um, so here's just an example of measuring in artifacts when we find them. We take coordinates, and every unit that we open up is tied into a larger site datum so we can reconstruct the whole site in depth below surface. And uh, this is just a typical soil profile. Um, and we recorded, here's how we can see this. This is from JT Berry, but this dark, our A horizon, we have an A horizon and a B horizon in subsoil. It actually gets down to eventually the um, the sea glacial sands. And this is a plow zone. And you can tell that it's very, there's a very distinct line. And if we didn't have a plow zone, and some areas aren't plowed, but a lot are, um, it would be a lot more gradual of, of a change, shift between the A and the B. So we have our A, and we have a B1, and a B2, and a C. So we always record these, and that's a typical, um, very typical profile for around here. We record the colors and the texture, so when it changes, we'll know if, if there's a feature, for instance. Okay, so the three phases of an archaeological survey that we did out at JT Berry were the intensive survey, uh, then we did the site exam, and then we did a data recovery. So I just want to go through them. And um, so I have reconnaissance here, too. So on a phase one, you, a reconnaissance is a walkover. So first you walk over a site, know anything before you actually start digging. And then the intensive survey is designed to collect, just to see if there's a site there or not, where the concentrations may be. So, and as I said, it, it gets triggered by either there's a known site or there's a special permit that needs to be, that requires it. Um, and then we would go and what, when we did, we, we choose the areas judgmentally. So where would you want to camp? If it's a nice sandy knoll, there's some water. Um, we usually don't go on really steep slopes, but sometimes, you know, we might check it out just to see. You never know. Lately, some subterranean structures have been found in Connecticut, which has given us all, and actually one in Drakeet as well, which has given us all a little bit of a pause because they've been in the sides of hills. And they've been very early, big features that have been found in the sides of, uh, on, in slopes. So now we're starting to test them a little more when we find them on a, uh, when we have slopes in a project area. But this is the stage where we're just going to see what's there and if there is anything there. And sometimes we don't find anything, but if we do, then um, then we would, uh, we would recommend um, more evaluation. So on an intensive survey, we start off by digging 50 by 50 centimeter test pits, such as that. And usually one person is digging and the other person is screening. We excavate by 10 centimeter meter levels. 
and we bag everything by level, do this across the site, um, and we record all our soil profiles <coughs> for every test pit, and uh, put down the different colors. These are colors, and actual, there's a color chart that we use called the Munsell color chart, and everybody uses it over the world, across the world. And, so any place in the world, a geologist or a soil scientist, if you said, I have a, um, a 10YR32, they would all know that that's a dark brown, that's a dark brown you're talking about, because uh, everyone's familiar with the month's health. Um, but these are just one wall of a profile of one of those 50, 50 centimeter test heads. So this was our um, project map, as big as I thought it might be up here. But um, all of these areas, a little bit blurry, but all of the, you can see the, the red, these are all our different fine spots or, as I mentioned, we had loci, different areas within the site that we concentrated on where we found large concentrations of artifacts. Um, so we had locus, uh, locus 1, locus 2, locus 3, Locus 4, 5, um, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And then there were a couple of just isolated fine spots. So what we recommended, we found a, a bunch of, um, a, a moderate amount of artifacts in these, but it's limited testing. So what we said is, okay, we have nine sites here. If you can't avoid them, of course they were sort of all over the project area, then we'll have to do a site evaluation. So what the developers said is that they could avoid, um, they could avoid locus eight, which is right here. That was not going to be dis dis disturbed. So we put a protection, site protection. Um, uh, we, we made a, a, a do not disturb policy for for locus eight, so they can never disturb it. And if they do, then we'll have to have an archaeological survey for that. Uh, more to, more. Um, evaluation. But for the rest of them, the eight other loci, we needed to go on and do site evaluation to find out how large they were and what um, else they may, if we could find any features. A little bit more about the internal complexity of the site. So when we do this, we actually do a grid of test pits over that one area. And then we, so here we were on our site evaluation and you can see that you can see all these little dots, those are all our test pits. So we did a five meter grid over the area until we had test pits along the edges that, didn't, that did not have any cultural material, didn't have any artifacts or features. And then we, we determined that to be the boundary. Now some of the sites, the boundary was the road. And most likely, the JT Berry site went across the road and was in this whole flat area where all the buildings were as well. I think that actually that was probably the main part of the site. But we did a grid over all uh, eight of the, uh, of the low side, and then we determined, based on what we found, <coughs> that uh, five of them still, and, and, and at, this, at this stage we're also determining if they're eligible to be on the National Register. If they seem like a significant enough site to be on the National Register <coughs> of Historic Places. And we determined that five of them were. Two of them, Locus 4, I mean Locus 5, and Locus 2, and, like, and Locus 7, actually three of them, uh, really did not, they really, there was a very low density of artifacts, and it was all in that plow zone. We didn't have any features, we didn't have anything deeper than about 20 or 30 centimeters below the surface. So we, we didn't need to do more evaluation on them. So at the site exam level, we do the 50 by 50s, but we also excavate. This is actually near where the water towers were, if anybody remembers the water towers in that spot. We also open up one by one meter units during the site evaluation, this phase two. And in this case, we found a feature. This is a charcoal pit, and it's down at 60 centimeters below the surface. We came down on it. So one of them, um, and so we knew that uh, this area, we have our features, we have our artifacts, so it was a significant site. 
And again, our one by, we do these by the 10 centimeter levels, everything's bagged separately by level. 